Hello to you and welcome to this virtual Bible study. This is the first in a series of roughly 30 lessons. Uh, hopefully they'll all be under a half an hour long. I'll open with prayer and we'll get into scripture and, and do a survey of the Old Testament. I've called it From Dust to Glory. I stole the title from a preacher friend of mine, but it's a great series where we start in Genesis 1 verse 1 today and we end up in the prophets just before the Gospels where Jesus is bringing in his messiahship, ushering in his kingdom. Uh, but to get us to Jesus, we need to know the backstory. We have to understand that God didn't just start in the New Testament doing something brand new. Rather, the New Testament is a fulfillment of the Old Testament, and we are spiritual heirs of Israel. And so we have to understand the story of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, from Abraham to Moses to Jesus himself. And so to understand that, I think we have to get into the content of the Bible. Sadly, I know a lot of people who love the Bible, who, who say that they believe it and that it is God's sacred word and that it's true and, and at all times applicable in life. And they believe very high things about the Bible. They hold it in high esteem, and yet they don't know much about the Bible. I know far too many who have a desire to know the Bible, but they lack the content. They're not familiar with the stories, at least not the overarching themes, the major stories. This survey, even in 30 weeks, will not cover all of the nitty-gritty details, but I hope to piece together a big picture, a thematic journey from Genesis to the prophets that sets up the scene for the entry of Jesus Christ so that the New Testament will make sense to us in light of its Old Testament counterpart. We are a New Testament church, but frankly, all that means is we are a fulfillment of Old Testament Bible truth. And so we don't believe we are some separate body that, that no longer needs the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. Rather, all that the Old Testament promised has been realized in the person and the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? And we'll get into today's lesson, which I've titled Creation. Father in heaven, we thank you for your sacred word, for the Holy Bible the way that it impacts us, the way that it comes to life. Uh, many have said that my teaching helps bring the Bible to life, uh, but that is not true because I cannot bring to life what is already alive. Your word is living and active, and it can pierce us in our souls, help expose sin that we might repent and turn from, and encourage us toward good deeds for your kingdom service. We pray that we would be edified as your people through this study. We lift up our brothers and sisters who are sick and suffering, those who are serving in the mission field, spreading your good news to people who need to hear it. We pray for our nation and those who are currently affected by a pandemic like COVID-19. We pray for those serving in the front lines, that you would give them wisdom and discernment and continue to keep them healthy. We pray tonight for those who are distant from you, those who, who have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord or their Savior. And I pray that in some way we may be a beacon of hope to them, that we might shine your light in the darkest reaches of this fallen world as we prepare for the world to come, in which there is life abundant and love eternal. We know it because of the work of your Spirit in us and through us now, and we pray for that work to continue, even as we study Genesis 1, verse 1. Speak to us through your holy word. Mold us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Again, I appreciate you being with me for this study, and uh, I want to read to you Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. If you're using your Bible, turn to page 1, and uh, the very first words, in the beginning which is, of course, the meaning of Genesis. Something has a Genesis. It has a beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we'll stop there. Already in this statement, the first sentence of sacred scripture, there is a bold declaration, and it consists of three terms. God, beginning, created. Well, I said those in the wrong order. Beginning, God, created. I think those three words help us to understand what's happening here. Beginning, God created. Let's look at the beginning. 
beginning already says much about our Christian faith. The perspective of believers, Old and New Testament believers in God, is that there is a beginning of time. Now we may take that for granted, but many ancient philosophers and many modern philosophers have taught a, a theory of, of this eternal cycle. Essentially that time doesn't really ever stop or start, it just keeps going and going and going. There is no beginning, and there is no end, and there's no purpose. In fact, that's the problem with such a theory. Not only is it hard to explain how something is that never was, but beyond that, there's no purpose in it. If it had no beginning and has no end, there's no point. Uh, there's no point to it. And I say Nietzsche because he revived that concept in the 19th century so that many modern philosophers have jumped on board. And even though you as a believer in Jesus, I hope you're a believer in Jesus, even though you may believe that time had a beginning, many of your neighbors and co-workers and friends, certainly many people in this nation and around the world, would not agree. They would argue that time had no beginning. And maybe the universe suddenly began, but even that didn't really have a point of, of beginning. It, it just, it always sort of has been. And that gets into some complicated astrophysics and, and philosophy and things that we don't have time to talk about. But suffice to say that the Christian foundational truth is not simply that there's a God, but that God started something new and he was the action that started it. Within himself, the activity was performed. Those are the three things caught in these words. Beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created. So there's a beginning. And if there's a beginning, then there has to be a precedent for that. Something before the beginning. There, there has to be something that always was. That's why many people would argue that time just keeps on going with no purpose. Because they know that if not, then there had to be something that started it. The good news is even modern science pretty well agrees with the Christian truth of a beginning. Now, they may say that beginning was 15 to 18 billion years ago, when a point of singularity, an infinitesimal point of all matter and substance in the universe, suddenly exploded, thus the Big Bang, and all that is became. Of course, they're arguing that there already was something, and there's no explanation for the beginning of that something. And so, theory steps in. Already, that's a, a pretty broad hypothesis of, of a Big Bang, but, but the word theory is a reminder that it's just a concept someone has come up with to try to explain the unexplainable. It's been said that when scientists finally reach the mountaintop of their journey in, in understanding the origin of all things, they'll find that a theologian was already there, that God had an explanation all along. We believe that God created, and we believe he created in the beginning, so that he started this work, and it's still going. So there's a beginning, but more than that, there's a God. For there to be a beginning, something had to make it, something that already existed, something that has always been, something that had no beginning, in this case someone, namely God himself. The Bible doesn't explain where God comes from or how he came to be, there's no defense of the being of God. Rather, there's just this bold declaration that God was and God created all that is. In the beginning, God. God, the force behind it all. We'll come back to God. The third word, created. So there's a force of creation. God isn't just named. He's not just mentioned. He's involved. He's active. He's done something. In the beginning, God created. God has made all that there is. Now, I'd like to think I'm a creative person. Some of you know that, that I do some art. Uh, I, I play a few instruments uh, at a sort of mediocre level. I try to sing from time to time. I've tried painting. Uh, not good at any of it, but I try to be creative. At least some might call it creative. It's a fun experience to make sounds out of notes on paper, to try to make them beautiful. It's exciting to take a brush and paint and, and press against a canvas and watch things come to life before your eyes to see vibrant pictures forming. But really, in, in many ways, none of that is creative, per se, because all I'm doing is taking substances that are already in existence and I'm putting them on some other substance, like a canvas or playing through an instrument or something someone has made and, 
And I'm doing all of this to try to form something beautiful, but even the beautiful things I form have an origin of some kind. What I'm trying to say about all of this is God is truly creative in a way that we cannot be creative because God didn't pick up a paintbrush in the paint and begin painting on the canvas of the earth. He didn't see the notes on the page and pick up his instrument and begin to play beautiful music. Rather, God stepped into something where there was nothing and he created. The theological term here is ex nihilo, out of nothing. God made something out of nothing, only a being who is existent within himself, could pull that off. And so we claim that God has a seity, A-S-E-I-T-Y, a seity. God is self-existent and eternally existent. He always has been and always will be, and he is because he is. In fact, that's the very name of God in the Hebrew text. Yahweh, I am that I am. I have always been and always will be. That's the thrust of God's name in Scripture, that he's the force behind all other forces. He's the being that gives us being. He always has been. And so God can create in a way that we could not even imagine. And so he creates, but in what kind of place does his creation enter? Verse 2 will help us. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So there's a description, three negative descriptors here, of the cosmos before God creates. Again, there was nothing there. And so these three words in their ancient context were really the three philosophical concepts that were scariest for people. Three things that would frighten almost anyone. First of all, without form or formless. So it was formless. Now, even the thought of being formless we can't understand because we have forms. To truly be formless, you'd have to have no form to base it on to begin with. Again, it's hard to wrap our minds around, but formlessness is to have nothing to compare with. It's, it's absolute nothingness. And void, void meaning empty. So it's without form and it's empty. The universe was empty. Many of us know the feeling of emptiness, whether it's emotional relational emptiness, or maybe the feeling of an empty nest when kids have moved away, or the emptiness of a home after a spouse has died, or the emptiness of a room when you're all alone. We know what it means to be empty, but imagine a universe completely empty and void. Nothing there. And finally, darkness. Again, a negative. Although darkness sounds like a thing, we know that it's the absence of a thing, the absence of light. Darkness is the absence of light. And this is the deepest kind of darkness. Before God enters in and makes something, there's nothing, and it's dark. But the Spirit of God hovers over the face of the waters. In verse 3, God said, let there be light. And there was light. There's this powerful moment where God creates. God creates out of nothing something. And what he creates is the antidote for the formless, empty darkness. He creates light. And then soon enough, he orders a universe one piece at a time. He's setting a stage. And he does it by the word of his power. In fact, that's all we know about how God created. People like to argue creation narrative. How long did it really take? It says a day. Does that mean a literal 24-hour day? Does it mean a thousand years? Does it mean eons of time, epochs of time? Could it have been billions of years? Uh, is God creating a world that adapts over time? Uh, it, there are so many theories and, and ideas from Christians and non-Christians, but even within faithful Christianity, people have all different opinions. And, and frankly, it doesn't matter as long as you believe God created it. And the only thing the Bible tells us by way of how he created it, the mode of creation, is his word. God creates by his word. He says, let there be light. In ancient context, there's a phrase in Latin, fiat, kind of like the little sport car, fiat. And fiat is a royal decree. It could be arbitrary, it could be important, but when a king, a totalitarian king, says something 
it is to be done. And that's basically what it means. It is said, it is done. Fiat, a royal decree. St. Augustine said that this was God's divine fiat, that the God of universe, the God of order, spoke and it became. Into formless, empty darkness, he spoke, let there be light, and the light was born from nowhere but within himself. God speaks and it comes to pass. His word is power. In the beginning, God created. A God who has that kind of power is a God worthy of our worship. And he says, let there be light. It's his answer to the darkness that was. In it, he creates light. Just as in our lives, when things are darkest, he can step in and shine his light. And so the God of the universe says, let there be light. And he begins to set the stage putting every piece where it belongs until finally he reaches down into the dust of the earth and he breathes his own spirit into the nostrils of man made in his image and for his glory. And so continues this marvelous story.